Brand disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed by individuals on this platform, the callers plus invited guests are their own. The information you hear does not reflect the overall views of all parties associated with this brand. We encourage everyone to research all things heard live or via archive for edification purposes. Discretion is advised. That dial. You're now listening to the Big Talk View Radio. Help keep the show on the air. If you want to help, you can send your donation to PayPal. The email is you at gmail.com or through Cash App, dollar sign Sal Showtime. Thanks for your support. Alright family, we are back once again. This is Debate Talk for you Radio. Today's topic is ancestral burial. Does it matter, you know, how we are buried? All of these things we're gonna answer the questions to tonight are right here on Debate Talk for you Radio. As people know, a lot of us, a lot of us are not prepared, a lot of us are not ready, or a lot of us are just totally oblivious of preparing for the next life. And uh we're gonna get some information tonight on how important it is you know, to prepare, not only to prepare, but how, you know, our bodies are placed in the ground, things of that nature. But my special guest is here, Director Z. Welcome to the program. Uh, Greetings, greetings, uh, Brother Sal. Uh, Thank you for uh, the opportunity to come on your platform and share uh, information, vital information with your listeners about what they need to do in terms of um, going back to a more natural, a natural burial and funeral system. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, most definitely, man. I appreciate you for coming on and bringing the information to the platform. We have a lot of people on the phone lines. Like I said, family, you can just press number one and we'll add you to the conversation later on. You know, that number, 319-527-6239. My next special guest is here, Sister Maya. Welcome to the program. Hi, Shalom family. I'm glad to be here to support this ministry and this organization this brother has. I think it is so desperately needed in our Hebraic community. And the, and the family out here, Israel, need to know that they are here and this service is available. So I, I'm just happy and I'm honored and humbled to be here along with this brother. All right. Once again, we appreciate you. And by the way, everybody, uh, in the description box, I'm going to leave the link to all the information if you want to reach out to Director Z and, uh, you know, see what's going on as far as Ancestral Burial Society. In the meantime, let's hear more about it. Uh, Director Z, tell us a little more about what you do. Go ahead. Indeed. Well, we are uh, uh, owned and operated, self-owned and operated, I like to call it, a uh, community organization which advocates for and provides natural burial preparation, funeral, burial, cemetery, and aftercare services, uh, which do not desecrate the body of the deceased. Uh, in doing so, we naturally prepare bodies for burial and also help families or teach them or others who want to know about doing that. Um, also, Nothing we do pollutes the environment. And also another thing that we're very much focused on is the economics by utilizing systems that does not impoverish families and put them in the poorhouse. Also, a focus of us in doing green burial, a natural burial, or ancestral burial, those words are synonymous, is to show families how they need to protect their family economy. So... When people die, oftentimes families, due to a lack of strategic planning and and estate planning, uh, they find themselves in poverty. So that's another focus of us, of our uh, organization, where we do estate planning and show families how to structure certain things to be able to absorb and be able to deal with the death of a loved one or a relative or a family member or a key person. And um, another thing I might mention, another focus of ours is showing families how to maintain maintain that intergenerational family connection, meaning oftentimes in modern society, out of mind. When somebody dies, 
I mean, the funeral, yes, maybe a week goes by and they're completely out of mind. So people are used to just forgetting about their family members. And it's the, after the burial, that's about it. They think their obligations are up. So we sort of focus on quite a few of those areas. Briefly, if I may finish by mentioning these few things, we also provide workshops to train people and organizations in natural burial. We have a burial academy that teaches classes, courses, and programs. We also utilize and we run our own family burial fund. And what that means is contributing families. We have a, how would you say, a collection to take care of any needs, especially emergency needs that are above and beyond what would be required for a burial. We already have our own burial fund managing it for families that are contributing members. We also provide emergency burial assistance to widows and children. And uh, we also extend burial society membership. We have a membership to those that would desire to join and work with the Ancestral Burial Society. And if a person or a family or organization gets membership, of course, there's extensive benefits that come along with that. I'll close it off by saying one of the projects we're working on right now, among many others, is we're seeking to acquire a cemetery that's owned, community owned, of five acres or more, and that cemetery will be used to provide natural burial and also affordable burial options. And uh, if anyone knows, of course, listing of any land that's available for sale, uh, please contact us via, as our Brother Sal mentioned, the link that's there for those that are listening or viewing through the internet or just contact us at our email, greenburialsociety at gmail.com. All right, family. Once again, the number is 319-527-6239. That was Dr. Z. And we have Sister Maya right here on the platform, right here on the Bay Talk Radio. Now, listen, let's just keep it real, guys. A lot of people don't like talking about death. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, in our mm-hmm. community, people don't want to prepare for that. They're not even ready for this kind of stuff. Um, but this ancestral burial, like some people, what is that? What is an ancestral burial? And why is that important to our community? Go ahead, Dr. Z. Um, sure. Uh, director, uh, that's fine. Uh, Brother Sal, thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm glad that you asked that question because, you know, words are important and words shouldn't be used lightly. So I'll start that off. I'll start my description of what ancestral burial means by saying this. Words, when words and terms are expanded to include things that the original creators of those words, the authors of those words, or the meanings, the original meanings never intended to describe or represent, such words often lose all meaning, significance, and value. So I said all that to say we have to define what burial is to give a definition for ancestral burial. Burial It's the law of nature and natural law and traditional cultures, many traditional cultures, that families are responsible for and must bury their own family members. When a person dies, they become an ancestor. Basically, when you have a relative that dies, they become an ancestor because that's one of your relatives that died before you. They're an ancestor to their living family members, and their living family members are responsible for burying their deceased relatives or quote ancestors this is what the term burial originally was used to describe family members burying their deceased relatives or ancestors thus ancestral burial is a natural form of human burial and simply means burying your own deceased relative now i said all that to say this what most people are familiar with and relate to or describe as burial is outsourcing, meaning relying on somebody else outside your family to bury your loved ones. So we're going to call that outsourcing. Outsourcing the burial of family members disrupts and eliminates ancestral burial, which is, again, families burying their own relatives. So that hopefully that answers your question, um, Brother Sal. That's what ancestral means, ancestral burial means, it describes the original form of burial, which is families burying their own relatives. And when I say that, I want to be very succinct. That means families preparing the bodies of their loved ones, families doing the funeral, 
And when I say doing the funeral, I'm going all the way. The original type of funerals was you held a funeral for your loved one in your family home or a family home. So the outsourcing includes funeral homes. I'll get into all of that in a minute, but even a funeral home is an artificial way of burying somebody. You go back 150, 160 years, modern funeral homes didn't exist. So how did people hold funerals? In the family home. So ancestral burial includes preparing the loved one's body, the family members, having a funeral or quote unquote a wake or a viewing or whatever a family does in a family home or family residence. Also, burying someone, your relative, on your family land, in your own family cemetery on your family land. That is also a descriptor or part of ancestral burial. And that includes everything else. So in other words, ancestral burial is describing the entire process. Families preparing the bodies of their loved ones. Families having the, the, uh, the wake or the funeral in the family home. And also families burying your loved one in your own family-owned cemetery on your own family-owned land. Most people would re- uh, describe burial under what they understand, which is a more modern artificial process. Uh, performance of what they call burial. Outsourcing your loved one's body to be prepared by a funeral home. Outsourcing their body to be buried in a cemetery and outsourcing everything along in between and afterwards. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, All right, I, I, I definitely. Yeah, we'll get to you. Once again, it's Ancestral Burial. The number is 319-527-6239. I see people on the phone line. Simply press number one. But uh, Sister Maya, you know, you, you actually uh, introduced... Uh, director Z to me and you wanted this information to come out and I'm gonna ask you as well like what what is it that's you know people need to know when it comes to ancestral burial okay um I, the thing about this I that's why I got him on, him on the program because he's the expert and what he I had him on our when I found out about him but let me back up when uh, there's a dude, uh, beloved brother that I met um, through Facebook. Everybody kind of know him. He was the general, and he um, suffered, a lot of people know, um, a violent death. And um, when I got a chance to view his funeral, I seen that it seemed like to me it had something of a Hebraic origins behind it. I had never seen anything like that. And then on um, Facebook, I ran across um, an occupant by the name of Moshe and reached out to him, and that's when he hooked me up with Ancestral Burial and come to find out that they were the same ones that um, did the general funeral. And I thought, you know, this is so very important that Israel needs to know about this, you know, because death can, you know, step up to our doorstep at any time. And then a lot of times we're on Facebook preaching doctrine with this, this, and that, and then something happens, and then our body ends up at at our mama's pastor church on a Saturday being preached over by a, a Christian preacher that you never knew, and um, so that's why I just thought that this is very important to bring to the forefront to let Israel know that these people are out here. Um, they work with you with payments. They got all kind of beautiful things to get things done. Should something happen to you unexpectedly on your journey, so um, that's that's kind of what I'm going to say for now, and I yield. All right. And once again, family, I see the Facebook family out there commenting in certain groups. We appreciate you. And I'm going to read some of your questions later on. If you have any uh, comments that's interesting, I'm going to definitely read them for my special guest. The number again, 319-527-6239. If you're already on the phone line, simply press number one and we'll add you in. Uh, now, again, this is a topic that a lot of people dread. And um, I'm hearing the benefits of uh, the Ancestral Burial Society. But uh, Director Z, let people know how uh, you know, because people are when when people die, a lot of people don't really uh, care. They just care about the the money, like how cheap it is to bury someone. That's what they that's their focus on, like money and you know wherever you throw the body. Hey, <laughs> as long as I can afford it, that's all that matters. Uh, and you know something like this, they will probably overlook because of money. And we spoke about these things over the phone. Uh, let's talk about that, you know, and let people know, you know, why, what they do with these bodies, you know, when people die, you know, people just think it's just a simple process and, you know, it is what it is. Let people know some of the things that go into this. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, just now to give some context, because as, as you mentioned, some of the listeners may be saying, you know, what does it matter? 
if the family buries the loved one? What does it matter uh, between, you know, letting the family do it or the funeral home? Well, let's get into that to show the complete difference. And before I say that, that would be equivalent to somebody saying, what does it matter to homeschool your children rather than letting your children go to the public school system? Is, the, is there a difference? Are the results the same? Well, the results are completely different. And in terms of burial, it's the same exact thing. Let's get into the funeral industry, the mainstream funeral industry, which for right now, we're going to call a toxic mainstream funeral burial and cemetery industry. Now, to give some context to the listeners, the modern funeral, burial, and cemetery industries, because they're all in one, originated in the U.S. Civil War, during the U.S. Civil War. Everything changed during the Civil War. And you often hear the term or may hear the term that war brings out new technology oftentimes. Well, that is true in this case. In the U.S. Civil War, many soldiers, thousands and thousands and thousands, died far away from where their family lived. So there was already some emerging technology concerning embalming and, and body preservation. When it became apparent that it was not possible to take the decaying or decayed bodies of soldiers off of battlefields during the Civil War and transport them hundreds of thousands of miles without, of course, some serious health issues, that's when those that were in the forefront of this emerging embalming process were authorized to actually start running embalming businesses and doing it on soldiers' bodies to bring their, them to their families. So I want to give some context on that. That's the origin of the modern funeral, burial, and cemetery industry in the West and really globally because it started in the U.S. and then it just branched out. Now, with that said, the original embalming fluid just like it is today, but it was, it was, it was in another form back then. Um, it was toxic. It had many different toxic materials in it, and they used it to arrest, if you will, deterioration until they could get those soldiers back home. Now, I want to jump forward very quickly and now talk quickly about what they do today in terms of the funeral home. When you send your, your relative or loved one's body to a funeral home, they drain the blood out of the body, out of the uh, arteries, veins, etc., and they inject toxic chemical liquids, okay, into the veins. Some people know that as formaldehyde. That's one of the things, but nonetheless, it quote unquote in order to arrest deterioration. Also, some of the other things that they expose your loved one's body to are disinfect disinfectants, chemical disinfectants, uh, emulsifiers, skin conditioners, conditioning agents, pre-injection fluids, cavity fluids. Look, I could go on and on. The point I'm making is you could see now how different preparing your loved one's body at home is from the funeral home. Now, let me continue. So they expose the loved one's bodies to all this, and also be aware that they may fill up their loved one's body cavity or body areas with foreign materials, including newspapers. They may sew or glue the eyelids and the lips of your loved one shut. That's standard. That's common. That's not uh, uh, something unusual in the mainstream funeral industry. Um, so, there's many other things, but let me make sure I mention this. These toxic chemicals that they either put in or on the bodies of your loved ones are cancer-causing agents. They cause cancer to the people that are doing it, the embalmers, and also when they put that in the body and then bury the body, eventually, you know, coffins deteriorate, bodies deteriorate. Those chemicals go into the earth. And they, can see, they will seep through the, the, uh, the, the ground, the dirt, the earth, and also possibly, potentially, go into the groundwater. So let me be very clear from the jump so people will know the distinction between home, burial, ancestral burial, natural burial, and the mainstream funeral burial. You're polluting the earth. You're polluting the earth. You're polluting the person's body. 
um, and we consider it domestic abuse, ancestral abuse, ancestral abandonment, poisoning, biological terrorism, and environmental pollution. To do all that to a deceased person and then put them in the ground, it's a form of insanity. So those are some of the differences, uh, drastic differences. I'll also, if I may, mention some other differences. It is common in the mainstream funeral industry for there to be physical abuse, for bodies to end up with bruises that they didn't go into the funeral home with because of the carelessness and just the sick, the, the sick uh, behavior of a lot of uh, funeral home personnel. Let me make sure I mention, no, I'm not accusing all funeral home personnel of doing that. But it's so common, it's not exceptional when it comes out in the news that somebody gets arrested. That's the point I'm making. So bodies are, you know, that abuse of bodies is something that happens. Stealing from the dead, funeral home personnel are routinely arrested or found out to be stealing from the dead. When the body goes either in the morgue or in the funeral home and they may still have some of the personal effects, just Google in uh, stealing from the dead or funeral home workers caught for stealing from the dead or abusing bodies. You'll see the results. You'll see it. Also, another thing that occurs to some degree in the modern funeral home system is necrophilia. Necrophilia, for those that may not be aware, is sex with the dead. There have been cases of morgue personnel or funeral home personnel that have sex with dead bodies. Yes, it's not an urban legend, not at all. They'll sexually abuse the dead body. That occurs. We, we are in our burial program, that's one of the things we highlight. Showing articles, people actually being convicted, the whole nine yards. Now, organ trafficking definitely occurs in the uh, funeral industry. Absolutely, 100%. Illegal organ trafficking, because, of course, as you all know, there's an organ donation uh, uh, business so that people elect, for whatever reason, to donate their organs. I'm not even talking about that. I'll get to that in a minute. But there is an underground business of illegal organ trafficking where funeral home personnel have been arrested and convicted and jailed for body parts without permission of the deceased or their family. And they sell those body parts of the deceased to tissue companies for medical research, um, you know, whatever else. So that does occur in the funeral home industry, or the modern funeral industry, I should mention. And for those that uh, uh, also need to know, it is common for funeral home personnel to rip the teeth out of dead bodies to extract the gold or the silver fillings. That is common. It occurs. So with that said, these are just some of the things that occur commonly in the funeral, the modern funeral industry. We regard that as that's not burial. Just like we would not regard, how would I put it? We wouldn't regard going into a fast food restaurant and call that healthy home cooking. We don't regard what occurs in the funeral home industry as burial. We regard that as what it is, tax, uh, human taxidermy. You all know what taxidermy is, right? Taking an animal and uh, stuffing it. That's what they're doing. They're stuffing your loved ones with all types of chemicals and all sorts of foreign matters and put them on display at what is called a wake, just like they uh, taxidermize an animal and put a tattoo on the wall. Also, I might mention, I don't want to forget, we regard what they do to human bodies in the modern funeral home industry as a form of transgenderism. What do I mean when I say transgenderism? Because it is common for the funeral homes in an attempt to make the body look as natural as possible, which is ridiculous, they put makeup on, uh, on bodies. Now, they put makeup on males and females. So if a man wasn't wearing makeup during his life, why in the world would you put makeup, yes, makeup on his body when he's deceased? So we regard that even as a violation because that, you know, that's a form of transgenderism. Nonetheless, also, the coffins that they routinely sell of give to families as a so-called option, those $90,000 coffins with the spinning wings at the bottom, they're made of metal. A lot of them, are, or almost all of them, except for the natural wood ones, the majority of them are made of metals and include 
or contain toxic materials like toxic paints and toxic glues. So not only is the body a weapon of mass destruction now, after being injected with all these chemicals and put into the ground, the coffin itself is a weapon of mass destruction and environmental terrorism because now you're putting in a coffin in the ground that's full of all sorts of toxic chemicals that over time will deteriorate and pollute the earth and also possibly the groundwater. All right, wow, a lot of things um here and there's a lot of things that uh you know we have we didn't know or a lot of us didn't know and um uh, wow, you know, Sister Maya, you wanna chime in? I, I hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just saying yeah, that's a plethora of information. That's why I knew, you know, that it, it was needed for him to be on your platform, Sal, so we could get this information out here to our Hebrew community. Um, last time we had him on our ministry, um, Brother Zayab, I don't know if you touched it on it a little bit. Um, because I kind of been backwards and forth and what have you, um, about, because Israel, we got different things that go on with Israel. Some believe in um, getting the, the marriage um, contract or certificate with the state. Some don't believe it. Some say it's a two, but some just say having sex is marriage or whatever. But I just want you to touch a little bit on what happens when you have couples that are together in Israel and for whatever um you know, method they decide to call their marriage, how it affects when if one of them shall, um, you know, pass on a, unexpectedly. Uh, what have you seen in that arena? Could you please share with us? Absolutely. Now, if I may, right before I uh, address that uh, question, and it's a great question, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expand the discussion because there's a lot of folks listening in that have been invited to the show that they may you know, either be of a particular community or a particular faith or religion or whatever, or no religion. So there's quite a few folks listening in. And with that said, I'm going to do my best to make sure my answers or the information I provide is universal and exclusive to all. So I just wanted to mention that um, because there's a lot of folks listening that were invited to the show and they may all have different backgrounds, and that's fine. Natural and ancestral burial applies to everybody. Everything I just talked about with the funeral home industry, no one is exempt. So everything I'm saying, I'm going to just make sure I couch it towards that. But now to address the issue that you mentioned, uh, sister, if someone has, let's say they die, and they were quote, unquote, in a quote-unquote union, whatever that is. Again, you remember what I said about words and how if you expand words, it includes everything, the words start losing its meaning. So in, in today's society, many people are together, whether they call it uh, cultural marriage, shacking up, hanging out, shooting the breeze, whatever. And in their deepest heart of hearts, they may believe that is, you know, that that gives them a protection and they can go to society and society is going to have to recognize that. Well, the evidence shows that's not the case. If you, dear listener, are with someone in whatever capacity and you or that person dies and there's no legal, legitimate marriage certificate, what do I mean when I say legal and legitimate marriage certificate? I am not describing something you and them just slapped together, you know, in your own house. That Look, legal and legitimate marriage certification is what you could take, and it's recognized by a court. It's recognized by the government, the federal government. It's recognized by Social Security. It's recognized by insurance companies. The list goes on. Official government agency. So that's what I'm describing. Now, getting back to the point, if you, dear listener, and somebody you are with don't have legitimate marriage certification that is acceptable by government authorities or agencies, and you or that person dies, you are not eligible. They will not even recognize you as a spouse. You may run down to the morgue and say, you're so-and-so whatever you want to call it, your cultural wife or your cultural husband with no marriage certification, you will run down to the morgue and they'll turn you back. You're not family. That's the first word out their mouth. You're not family. Show us here. Are you, you, you said that you're, 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 the, you're the wife of the deceased? 
Okay. Where's your marriage certification? Oh, we can't let you in. Oh, uh, also, we cannot let you make any decisions concerning the body of the deceased. Oh, uh, no, you have no say. The funeral home will tell that person, you don't get to determine how the person's buried. Oh, so you're saying that you and your alleged spouse followed a certain lifestyle or culture? Well, you don't get to make the decisions because you don't have any legal marriage certification. Their family is going to default to their family. Also, I might add, um, when people die and they are quote unquote legally married, they have legal marriage certification, and I'll get into that in a second. Please bear with me. They are eligible for survivor benefits. Meaning, when you work, you pay into Social Security, and then you automatically, when one one of the spouses die, they get Social Security benefits, survivor benefits or eligible for somebody's pension, your spouse. If you don't have legal marriage certification, you can pontificate and spout all day that that's your spouse. In the eyes of Social Security Administration, the first word out their mouth will be, oh, you want to apply for social survivor's benefits with your marriage certification. And if you don't have that, you get nothing. And I might add that, Social Security survivors benefits for spouses last for the rest of your life. If you don't, of course, get married before a certain age. It's complex, but I'm just simply get, being very general here. It, you get that for the rest of your life. Your spouse already paid that by whatever was deducted from their paycheck when they were working. So you don't get any of that. I want to be very clear. So why am I saying all this? There are serious ramifications for people that have this idea that just because they're with someone physically, they're having sex, you're having children, whatever, people have this strange idea that they're going to be eligible, eligible for the benefits that society gives married people when one of them dies. You're not. You're not eligible for anything. Also, also, you are not eligible to inherit any of the person's property as a spouse would. When a person dies, typically it's like automatic. They're nearest of kin, which is if they're married, the spouse, and if they have children, that, you automatically are heir, uh, a person that inherits. Now, if, you're not, if you don't have any legal marriage certification when somebody dies, you're not an heir. Now, there's some other things they could do and put in place, but I'm not getting into all that. I'm just explaining if you don't, if you don't have legal marriage certification, you are not considered an heir. As a matter of fact, you're not even considered a biological re relative by society. Society meaning Social Security, the court system, the government, whatever, whatever we want to call it. So there are serious ramifications. We've seen it time and time again where men and women to work together, and oftentimes it was the man that died first, and the woman was left completely impoverished. She couldn't get the car because it was in his name. She wasn't on it. She's not a, a, a spouse. She couldn't get any money out of his bank account. The man had thousands and thousands and thousands. She got nothing. She couldn't get any survivor's benefits as far as spousal survivor benefits for the rest of her life from Social Security because she's not a spouse. And the list goes on and on. So um, thank you for asking that question because that's something we try our best to uh, mention to people, look, if you're with someone, you need to get married. Legally married, not whatever you have conjured up in your mind of, you know, whatever uh, belief. No, you have to get legally married in the sense of society accepting your marriage certification. Now, with that said, I am not telling you to go down to the court because, look, I just gave the whole discussion about outsourcing. Marriage was originally contracted between families. So, yes, you can actually contract a marriage and create a marriage certificate that is acceptable, acceptable by society. You can't do that. You can get married in your religious, if you're a religious person, in your religious organization. You can get married in your cultural uh, uh, belief system, if you have a cultural belief system. So there's several ways you can get married without going down to the court system. So I'm not telling you to do that.
all right. Man, there's a lot of information coming out right now about the director Z. Yeah, too young to live. As a matter of fact, you won't even be able to and to repeat it. You won't even be able to determine how the person is buried. So if you and them have a similar burial, you know, uh, culture, where you live, or whatever you want to call it, you can't even tell the funeral home that person lived this way and this is the way they should be buried. They will look at you like a stranger. And I will finish by saying this. Most of the families, the person that died, most of the person that Sure, sure. Yes. Did, uh, did did the phone drop off? Obviously, it did. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, it did. It dropped off. Yeah, well, sure. you can pick up where you left off if you remember. Uh, just remind me, uh, Sal, brother Sal, what part? What mm-hmm. part was the last part um, where it dropped off? If you can remind me. Yeah, it was breaking up a lot of parts, and then it just went off because it wasn't going in and out. So I kind of don't remember exactly where you left off at, but. We can continue because uh, there's a lot of information here. There's a lot of information. Got it. You know, uh, once again, the number is 319-527-6239. Again, I see people enjoying the program. And like I said, a lot of people don't want to speak about these topics. We're speaking about the importance of, you know, being married and there's different ways of, ma- you know, getting married uh, because they'll do uh, a number of things to the body. Uh, you won't have any rights in particular. You know, you could go more into that if you want to. Uh, go ahead. Sure, Absolutely. Well, to pick up, um, if a person doesn't have a legal marriage certificate, and when I say legal, I will yet again be clear. Legal means something that is acceptable by the government, the court system, uh, Social Security, insurance companies, etc. If a person or people are together and they don't have that, when somebody dies, you have no rights. You have no rights to determine how they're married. You cannot inherit any of their property as a spouse. You cannot determine how they're, they're buried. If you, if you and them were together and you bought joint property and the property was in their name, you have no rights to it because it's not in your name and you don't have the ability to uh, position yourself or present yourself as an heir or a spouse. So if nothing is in your name and it's in their name, I could go on and on. But the general point I want to emphasize is getting married and at the court system is not the only option. You can get married or create a marriage certificate that's acceptable by the courts or by Social Security or by insurance companies by getting that done through your family, your culture, or if you're a religious person, through your religion. However, I want to emphasize there's certain criteria that it must have for it to be acceptable by government authorities. It's not just two people sitting down and just saying, you know what, we're married and no, no, they'll laugh you out of that agency you go down to to try to turn something like that in. So there's a specific way to do that. And for those that are interested, that's a sidebar. We do have a, a, a connected organization, a marriage society that has a course or a class or gives workshops on people that are interested in contracting legal marriage certificates where they may not want to go down to the court, but they may want to do it among themselves. So to, to summarize, Unless a person has a legal marriage certificate, if either one of those parties dies, then for a world of hurt and a rude awakening. Hopefully that answers that question. All right. Straight with it. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Director Z letting you know what's going on. That's right. Uh, Tune in. You know the number 319-527-6239. A lot of people didn't know a lot of things, and they're listening to the program. And uh, once again, uh, there's a lot of people on the phone lines right about now. Again, simply press number one if you want to chime in, if you have any questions. I know this is a topic that a lot of people dread. You know, they don't want to talk about, you know, what happens when they die or if someone else has died. You know, they kind of stay away from this particular issue. Uh, and that brings me to the topic about life insurance, uh, Director Z. A lot, as you already know, a lot of us, if we were to pass away, wouldn't even have the funds to, uh, you know, take care of our, our bodies. Uh, so, therefore, people go, uh, as a result, they go to um, cremation, you know, and they think that's okay. <laughs> but, again, let's get into that. You know, what, what do, you, do you have any services when it comes to people that doesn't that we don't have the money, you know, for, you know, to get buried and things of that nature? Also, touch on uh, life insurance and the importance of, importance of it. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. That, that's a great question. 
I look, I personally and other people in the ancestral burial society, we've been in this field for years. I've been in this field for quite a few years. Look, I'll just give you my blunt opinion. Everybody has money. They, it's just what they choose to spend it on. People have money. I'm not saying all. You can look at how people spend money on discretionary items. Alcohol, fast food, sports, cable television, whatever. I'm not criticizing. I'm making a point. None of those are, those are discretionary items. You can survive without all of that. So oftentimes I've seen it and I've seen the results of people not properly preparing, scrambling, you know, when somebody dies. And it's not a result. I'm, from my experience, it's almost always. Not always, but almost always a result of poor planning and not a result of them not having any money. So when we talk about the term life insurance, look, let's, let's, let's disambiguate life insurance. There's different forms of life insurance. Insurance meaning you're doing something to insure or protect yourself against some adverse situation or condition. There's various levels of life insurance. So, so with that said, we do offer workshops on that. But before I even get into that, let's get to it. Each family should have a burial fund for your family. Money that's contributed in by different family members, and that money should never be touched. It's understood. Look, we're going to use that for burial. A burial fund. That is a form of insurance, is the point I'm making. That's internal life insurance. Every single family should have a burial fund. If people are a member of a culture, whatever cultural group you are a member of should have a burial fund. Nobody gets out of here alive. So your cultural group should have life insurance. If you're a member of a religious group or organization, your religious group or organization should have a burial fund for its members. Those are all life insurance. That's insuring those families, whoever is the participating contributors to that against the advent or, or the, uh, the uh, occurrence of death. And if that occurs, you already got your burial fund set up. You can now go into those funds and use it to take care of whatever needs to be done. And it's always going to be resupplied because it's in perpetuity. It's something you continue to uh, contribute to. So that's the first thing I wanted to mention. The number one Life insurance is insuring yourself by putting aside money in your family, your religion, your culture, your organization, whatever. You putting that money aside to make sure you take care of all costs associated with death. Number one, life insurance. Now, as far as what people would call the general life insurance, society life insurance, we advocate to people to make sure you get a minimum of at least $10,000. Why? Because based on which... Uh, zip code you're in a part of the country uh, burial, the cost of burial that's including the funeral home to the cemetery it varies, so in certain parts of the country burial could be uh, $4,000 other parts of the country maybe eight to $10,000, so we advocate to people just to cover, to make sure you cover burial have at least a minimum of $10,000 life insurance policy now, you do notice I said burial, right? Because do understand if somebody dies, you still have bills. You still have mortgages. You still have food, clothing, and shelter, especially if the person that died was the primary caregiver. So that $10,000 for burial is basic. You have to also factor in how much months or years do you want to give whoever you leave behind, your family, your wife, your husband, your spouse, your children, whatever. How many months of relief do you want to give them? And then whatever you factor in your monthly expenses, add that on top of the $10,000. Did that answer your question, hopefully? Oh, yeah, most definitely. Once again, I see we have uh, somebody now, question number one. Now, yes, now, yeah. b before that, Brother Sal, let me throw something in. I apologize. I just It came to me as you were talking. No problem. Go ahead. When we talk about yep. insurance, what are we really talking about? When we talk about insurance, what are we really talking about? I mentioned about you have to have a burial fund for your family. And if you're with a group of families, then those group of families should have a burial fund. And if you're in a community or 
organization and your community, your organization or your culture, your religion should have a burial fund. But let's go a bit further on this. Let's go get to a bit uh, further what that means. That literally means that you should not accept being a part of a family, a community, a culture, a religion, whatever. And there's not something in place to take care of expenses of death for that group. If you choose to be a member of any association, it could be a family, a culture, a religion, or organization, and they refuse to put a burial fund in place, you're doing it to yourself. You are doing that to yourself. It's like being in a family and you don't even get the basic things you need to survive in that family. Why are you even do, wasting your time in that family? Imagine if you saying, oh, I'm a proud family member of this family, but you don't even get food. You don't get water. You don't get clothes. Uh, so I'm mentioning that to say putting aside expenses for burial, like a burial fund, as I mentioned, that's the cost of living. So you need to make sure you, dear listener, Whatever association you're a part of, a family, a community, a culture, a religion, whatever, you better make sure you require that conditional upon your membership, that better be in place. And if it's not in place, then look, you know what you need to do. You don't need to waste any time. This is not a uh, playground. All right. Once again, the number is 319-527-6239. we got a caller standing by. We have a lot of callers on the, on the show right now. Again, simply press number one, family. Press number one if you want to chime in. But let's go to the phone lines. Let's go to 443 Alive. Hey, Sal Showtime, man. Hey, how you doing? And I just wanted to say, man, this is a great discussion. And really, to be honest with you, uh, my name is Brother Mercy. Be honest with you, the, uh, this death ministry is what you're talking about. A ministry of death is actually recorded in Scripture, and the thing is, uh, this is what the patriarchs were big on—a ministry of death. And, and this is where this is why people don't understand the Scriptures a lot of times because they have no ministry of death built in their ministry. And let me just say this: um, Sal brought up a point about the employ, employment or economics, and that does play a part. Because every job I've ever had offered me free life insurance. So every job don't do that, but a lot of your big companies do. They offer free complimentary life insurance, stuff that you don't even have to pay for. As long as you work for the company, they're giving you 50 to 100 grand. Just, I mean, the lowest is like 50 grand, you know. So what, 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 what I'm saying is I think some of our people may not have asked, because see, this, what you're talking about, bro, is really low-level stuff, and it's really stuff that white people get, like, on a – just they get that just impromptu, you know, without even working for it. And I just wanted to say we as a community talk about it. And, and like I said, I got it from my employer. I didn't get it from my family. I got it from my employer. And I came from a good family. Let me understand. But I got it from my employer. I didn't get it from my family. And I just wanted to say – or my church, excuse me. <laughs> I want to put that on the record All my church <laughs> So I just wanted to say Brother, you really hitting it on point With this because this needs To be built into our religious system And it needs to be built into our family Structure and in the old Times they did have family plots You know when you got married you, you normally Bought a family plot, plot uh, uh, You know to be buried but, And that was part of the marriage ceremony and I mean, part of the marriage agreement. And I just wanted to say, brother, I think people to get married should, should just like old times, should be obligated to get a burial plot because normally they were buried together. But I just wanted to say that, brother, this is very excellent, you know, discussion build that you have right here. And it needs to be built into our religious system. It needs to be built into our family structure. You know, it ain't about economics necessarily. It's about It's about education in the sense that, our family really don't talk about burial a lot, you know, as far as, you know, who gets what. And that goes into inheritance. See, brother, you really hitting it. And, and that builds on inheritance, passing on to the next generation. See, brother, you, this death ministry is just, is just the beginning of what we need to be talking about. But that's what I want to say, Brother Mercy. Uh, this is Brother Mercy. Kudos, man. Our director, sure. you can respond. You can respond. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, and thank you, uh, Brother Mercy. Uh, uh, thank you for your uh, comments and also pointing out a, quite a few uh, very important things. If I may mention, uh, ancestral burial is, is not a death ministry. 
Ancestral burial is a life ministry. Why do I say that? Life is a part of death is a part of life. And as you mentioned, I'm going to explain how that is. My family is funding or creating their own burial funds. That's the highest level you could get. Right now, you have a whole bunch of people out of work, millions. So whatever life insurance that they were depending on, many of them no longer have that. They have nothing because that was probably the only form of life insurance they depended on. Families having their own burial fund insurance, that's the highest level you can get because guess what? That will always be there. Even if you lose your job, the family insurance will always be there. So similar as I gave when the program started about the importance of making sure you have self-reliance or self-autonomy by taking care of your own with burial, the same thing goes for life insurance. Making sure that you got burial funds, ways of insuring within your family, your community, your culture, or organization, that will be in place even if you may lose your occupation. You may get injured on the job. Now you can't work anymore. You still have that family system in place. Um, and another thing I would mention also, um, when it comes to uh, the issue of insurance, the issue of insurance, going back, the brother uh, made a good, uh, excellent point, actually. It's so common when you walk on a uh, job, many employees, not all, but many, they, they offer that. They know that in order for somebody to come in and be a part of their team or be a part of their group, if it's an uh, employer, it's, it's the norm. They, got it. they have to offer you life insurance. You should require that same thing when you join a family. If you're getting married in a family, life insurance should be in place before you sign that paperwork. Yes. If you join a, a religion or a religious group, you should require that there's some burial in a uh, fund there for your family. If you're a part of a cultural community, the same way you require that the basic standard when you go on a job, I have to have life insurance. What if something happened to me? You should require that same thing for that cultural group or organization or religion or whatever. That's 101. And if you're not requiring that, then something is wrong with you. You may not be of the uh, requisite level of maturity that all adults need to realize that's basic, that's standard. So hopefully that sort of, thank you, brother, uh, for making those points. So I just wanted to comment on that. Yes, um, family funded, family burial funds, family organiz uh, organizational burial funds, religious burial funds, self initiated and controlled burial funds at the highest level because that is immune from anything going on outside of your family or your community or your culture. That's always in place for you. And that should be a mandatory obligation. Don't, why would you even join some, uh, I don't care what it is. I'm not getting particular. I'm not uh, pointing any particular thing out. Why would you join a family if they don't even got enough common sense or religion or organization or culture or whatever, if they don't even care about burying the dead? What does that tell you? Don't touch that dial. You're now listening to the Big Talkie Radio. All right, family, once again, the number is 319-527-6239. My special guest is Director Z. Right here on the Big Talkie Radio, we're talking about ancestral burials, you know, and a lot of information has been coming out. Like I said, family, you can express number one if you're already on the phone lines. If not, if you're on social media and you want to chime in, that number once again, 319-527-6239. Once you dial that number, press number one, and that lets me know that you uh, want to ask a question or you want to comment uh, on this particular topic. But um, let's talk about another issue when it comes to uh, money because, <laughs> you know, a lot of us base things on money. So there's people out there that's like, you know what? I'm not worried about that. You know, I'll just get the body cremated. You know, oh. let's, let's talk about <laughs> cremation. Let's talk about what goes into okay. being cremated. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up, Brother Sal. Look, a lot of times people have ideas and they may articulate the ideas or they may even believe the ideas strongly. 
but the ideas are not based in reality. It's not based on nature, logic, science, anything that is practical, realistic. So oftentimes, yes, you're right. Many people will refuse to take care of their responsibility to set up burial systems within the family, and they'll just delegate it to whoever is left behind. Oh, I'll leave somebody behind. They'll take care of it. Basically, that's abandoning your duty, and you're leaving all the mess to fall in somebody else's lap. But let's talk about cremation. Number one, if you look in cultures, we're going to start at the very top. If you look in cultures that practice cremation, None of what is done in Western or modern society cremation is what those cultures do. In certain uh, societies, cremation is, you know, it's the norm, such as in India, or maybe in certain Asian countries like Japan. Cremation may be the norm. But how is cremation done in those countries? They don't outsource the body to some crematory. I'm talking the traditional practice. Pay attention. The traditional practice of cremation in those societies is the family doing it. So even the modern system that people like to run to or talk about is such a great and mighty thing. Well, are you cremating your loved one? You're outsourcing cremation just like you're outsourcing the preparation of your body. So even that is problematic. Now, let's get into the cremation a bit further. How do you know that's your loved one's body? How? You don't have your own family members in there doing the cremation. How do you know that's their ashes that they're handing you? How do you know? Explain that. That's part of the problem and the error and the fault with modern cremation in Western societies and modern countries. You don't know who those ashes are from. It is normative, and I'm going to say this. When crematories are cremating bodies, it's literally, I, I'm going to say, it, it's impossible for them to get every single iota, every single atom, every molecule of the previous person they cremated out of that, out of that device. So that basically means your loved one, part of somebody else or somebody else's ashes are going to be mixed with your loved ones. Are you okay with that? That's insanity. Mm. That's part of the out. That's part of outsourcing. Also, some, uh, cre- crematories, they cremate pets. They cremate pets, not just humans, pets. So it is definitely within the realm of possibility. I argue it's certain. I'm not going to play with the possibility. It's certain because they cannot get every single atom or molecule out of something, a pet or a human, that they cremated. Look, we're not going to play games here. It is absolutely 100% possible and plausible and happens. That if they cremated, if they cremated pets at that facility, certain dusts or atoms or particles or molecules, whatever, are going to end up in the ashes of your loved one. So you're fine with Fido the dog being mixed in with Uncle Byron or Uncle Uncle Ralphie, huh? Is that what we're doing here now? So number one, I'm going to make a point. Again, the traditional cremation that's done in certain societies is done by the family. So number one, that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about outsourcing. Number two, how do you know that's the ashes of your loved one? You can't even verify that. How do you know? Number three, how do you stop somebody else's ashes being mixed with the ashes of your loved one? It's insanity. The whole thing is insane. And I mentioned by saying this at the end now. Dear listeners, please, please investigate. Don't take my word for it. In, in, in Georgia, in the Georgia area, a few years ago, there was an a, a owner, an operator of a crematory, the Marsh Crematory, I believe the name was. The gentleman's name was Brent Marsh, I believe. The authorities received a tip that sounded unbelievable until they confirmed it. This family was operating a crematory. And what they were doing, the, the son that was operating it, For years, he was taking the bodies of families, members that had died, and dumping them in a lake and in woods. Dumping them. He wasn't cremating anything. And years passed. And we're not talking about one. We're not talking about 10. We're not talking about 50. We're talking about hundreds of bodies. 
he was dumping them in a little river or lake or whatever. I forgot what it was, or a pond. I think it was a pond. And he was taking the family's money and handing them material that looked like ash. The families were so gullible because what are you going to do? How are you going to confirm that? The families were so gullible as most people are when they were crematory. They were taking the ash and putting it, I guess they were putting it wherever on their mantle and said, oh, look at Uncle Robert. Yeah, that was some concrete ash. So to make a long story short, when the authorities found out that this, what, that this is what this crematory operator was doing, they arrested him. They had a complete biohazard site. It was an absolute disaster. They had to fish all the bodies out the water, the pond. They did DNA tests on the bodies to confirm. It was an absolute mess. Look it up, dear listener, to confirm that I'm not making anything up. Now, why am I mentioning this? You cannot confirm that your ashes are your loved ones, so stop playing games. The only way to confirm is if you were doing cremation as they do in traditional cultures. Now, let's get to the gist of this, because I don't want to leave any stone unturned. Let's just go all the way with it. The only way, oh, let me say this. If we're talking in the context of certain religions or certain faiths, I'll answer that. The only way cremation in more traditional religions that don't practice, or cultures, if you will, that don't practice cremation, their normal system of burial is a burial, a grave burial. The only way cremation, cremation would be allowed is if there was something like a contagious disease, like Ebola, that would make people sick that are preparing the body. That's the only way cremation would be allowed in cultures that it is normal. It is mandatory for grave burial. And you'll notice, you'll know if your culture or your religion is mandatory. It says it in your, in your text. That's the only way cremation typically would be allowed, is if there's some contagious, highly contagious disease that's an immediate threat to public health. And it would sicken or kill or harm the people that are preparing the bodies, then cremation in those traditional cultures, it would allow. But that's an exception. That's an exception. That's not the rule. That's not the rule. So for those that are wondering, huh, I wonder if in my culture, your culture, religion, faith, it's simple. Look in your text. What do you see in your text? Do you see create cremation? Whatever your text of belief is. If you don't see that and all you see is grave burial, that answers the question. Stop playing games. Now, another, uh, another allowance in many traditional cultures, faith, religion, whatever, would allow cremation would be if a person died and the body was found after, uh, you know, maybe... Uh, in some deserted place, and in order to transport that body and, 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 and have it where the body wouldn't be harmful to those that's transporting it, then maybe, you know, they would cremate the body. And when I say cremate, I'm being very, very uh, particular here. Let me make sure I mention, let me, let me not even sugarcoat it. For those that may read the Bible or those that are of the Abrahamic faith or similar faith, there is a story in the biblical text narrative where King Saul and his son died in war and their bodies were taken by the enemy soldiers. The enemy soldiers affixed their bodies to the wall of one of the enemy cities. Now, that was such a disgrace that his family rounded up some armed men and they went to go take his body back. That's how important burial is. Those family members of King Saul and his son risked their lives because that's how disgraceful it is not to bury your own loved one. Nonetheless, when they got his body, it tells you in the text, for those that are of the Abrahamic faith, it tells you, it literally tells you, they cremated his body. Basically, what that would mean is they burnt his bones to remove all the flesh, because his bones and his, bo his body was in such a deteriorated state, it would have been harmful to transport. So they used fire to basically evaporated his flesh, and then they took the bones and buried it inside his family burial plot or cemetery. So I'm giving more context to that to those that may be of a particular faith that grave burial is the norm. It would be permissible under those circumstances, as I gave an example, if transporting the body would harm those that are transporting or handling the body, 
Or if the person died of a contagious disease, that would harm those that are dealing with the body, preparing the bodies for burial. But other than that, the only uh, uh, societies where cremation is the norm, it's already understood. You'll find it over in India. You'll find it over in, uh, uh, in uh, Asia and certain countries. And also in, in, in uh, ancient America, they did also deal with certain aspects of, uh, of that, but it was not of the type we're talking about. So hopefully that answers the question about cremation. If you can't verify those are the ashes of your loved ones, this whole conversation is ridiculous. Mm. The whole conversation about cremation, it's ridiculous. Wow, wow. I mean, that's very important, like a very important point that uh, Director Z brought out. Like, how do you know? You know, you might have some uh, ashes right there on your, you know, somewhere in your home, and it may be mixed, you know, with animals or all sorts of things, you know. Um, wow. <laughs> Definitely strong points on that one. But we do have another caller. Once again, the number is 319-527-6239. Again, family, just press number one. Don't be shy. Again, I know people don't like this topic, but it's something we got to talk about, family. We have to talk about these things. Uh, let's go to 443 a lot. Yeah, I, I forgot to ask this question, man. I got a question for this brother Mercy again. I was going to ask you um, now: uh, Would you? Is there any uh, insurance companies? I'm sorry, maybe you have said this already. I called in late, but I was wondering: Was any any places or insurance companies? I'm just saying places or insurance companies, and or insurance companies you would recommend getting a life insurance policy. And let me ask you another question: Is is uh, should you be looking for a certain type of company or with a certain type of backing to buy your life insurance policy, or uh, or does the life insurance policy? Need, I mean, I always wonder about this. The life insurance policy has to be backed by somebody or accredited in some sort, so that uh, you know you make sure you're getting a quality life insurance policy. I, I was just wondering, is there anything you recommend, or is there some things we should be looking for? To purchase life insurance policies, or do you recommend something different? Thank you, uh, sir. That's an excellent question. I thank you for it. Um, your question is very detailed, and I'll answer it in general. And I'm explaining to you out of respect why I'm answering it in general. There's some intricate details of where you want to get life insurance and what type of life insurance uh, generally we would recommend. Um, and to really answer that question really requires more time that we will have on this podcast. But I will answer it in a general sense. You need to get life insurance. If you're getting life insurance from a company, that company needs to have been in business for years. And when I say years, I'm talking about I, we recommend 30, 40 years because, you know, they have a track record of paying out. And they're responsible and they're reliable. So. Oftentimes, people may just figure any life insurance company is acceptable. No. Life insurance companies go out of business also. So you need, we all need to be aware of that. Um, now, in terms of life insurance, the way you need to structure it, again, that goes into a whole different uh, 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 realm that requires more extensive information that this podcast really we can't do. But what I would recommend is this. Contact us, uh, dear brother, uh, that just asked a question, and anyone else in the audience. Contact us at the link. Send an email or a message to us at the link that's on this podcast, and we will absolutely love to be able to talk to you one-on-one to explain a lot of what I'm talking about right now because it gets very detailed, and out of respect for the podcast, we know we don't have that much time. So hopefully that does address it. your question, uh, sir. All right, so family, once again, the link is in the description box. So if you want to reach out, the link is in the description box. Also put the Facebook page right here, the link uh, in the description box. It's going to also be on the YouTube page. So family, make sure you, uh, you know, go check it out. By the way, there's people out there on social media and some of the groups, uh, uh, Facebook, they're liking the information. And already some of them are like, you know, they're interested in this. Uh, you know, so could you put some information out there a little early uh, for those that are interested early? Uh, how do you, you know, when it comes to contacting you and getting this thing done, 
Uh, how do you go about reaching out to you? And also, are you available in different parts of the world? Okay. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, for those that are interested in contacting the, Bur- the Ancestral Burial Society and, you know, getting access to either the, the resources or the services that we provide, look at the link on the podcast, please. Um, that's the first thing I would suggest. Click on that link. It brings you right to a, a Google Doc page or a Google Form page, and it just has a whole listing of different links you can click on for what you're interested in. Um, now, other than clicking on the link for the podcast, we also have a Facebook page. The Facebook page for Ancestral Burial Society is Ancestral Burial. So you can also Ancestral Burial by clicking on that link that's on this podcast. But nonetheless, if you forget that, just type in Ancestral Burial and you'll see a picture It'll be of a tree and a nature scene, and you can just click a, a request, a friend request, and then we'll add you, and you can get all of us through that. Also, if you need to get a hold of us through email, you can uh, contact the Ancestral Burial Society by emailing us at our Gmail, greenburialsociety at gmail.com, greenburialsociety at gmail.com is the Ancestral Burial Society's email. So those three ways, um, you can click the link on this podcast. You can, act, you can uh, uh, reach us through Facebook. Ancestral Burial is the name of the Facebook page. And then you just type that in and, and send a friend request. We'll add you. Or Green Burial Society at gmail.com. All right, family, once again, the number is 319-527-6239. Today's show is entitled, we just joined in, Ancestral Burial. My special guest is Director Z. We're discussing this very important topic. Again, a lot of people dread this topic, but it needs to be heard. You need to speak about this as a community, as a people. And again, I see people are listening on social media and on the phone lines that are listening to the program. But again, you know, the number is 319-527-6239. If you want to chime in, press number one. We'll hear from you. Um, when it comes to – there's people that might be on the fence right now listening to the show, and they're saying, you know what, what's the difference between what, you know, other, you know, burials, you know, funeral homes do and what you do? Can you break down the difference? Thank you. Great question. Those that may have heard earlier, you should uh, be aware of what I mentioned. I'll, I'll go through it again briefly, but I'll give more context. The difference between natural burial or quote-unquote ancestral burial or quote-unquote green burial and what the modern mainstream female owned industries do are night and day. They're not the same. As I mentioned, I'll do a brief recap. The funeral home industry, when you give your loved one's body to them, they drain the blood out of your loved one. They pump in cancer-causing chemicals, embalming fluid and others into their body. They may pack the person's body cavity. The body cavity, I mean their anus, or if it's a woman, the vaginal cavity. Look, I'm just going to lay it out. They may pack their open cavities with who knows, anything to keep any sort of leakage or prevent any sort of leakage. I'm just giving it to what it is. They almost certainly regularly sew people's eyelids and lips shut. And they put makeup on the body. The list goes on and on. What we would call, that's not burial. That's not natural, traditional burial. Now, what we do as an ancestral burial society, let's be very clear now. This is what natural burial does or should do. First and foremost, what we do is gender appropriate. We have female personnel that prepare the bodies of women and girls. We have male personnel that prepare the bodies of men and boys. So we're not into the gender mixing when it comes to natural burial or ancestral burial. Ancestral burial requires gender separation. Male personnel to prepare male men and boys' bodies and female personnel to prepare female uh, women and girls' bodies. That's a difference. They don't do that in the mainstream funeral industry. Anybody could be working on your loved one. Now, other than that, something that we do that the funeral home industry doesn't do. We don't drain the blood. 
of the loved one. Everybody should be buried in, in an intact state as naturally as they came or they died. So we don't do draining blood. We don't utilize any toxic products or chemicals. We don't cut. We don't sew anybody's body. We don't do any unnecessary procedures that have absolutely nothing to do with burial to the deceased's body. We don't do any of that. And by doing that, we don't, that, that's, that's forms of desecration. You know, what, what the funeral home industry does, we work to prevent desecrating their body. Also, we work to prevent any sort of physical, sexual, or financial abuse of the deceased. Now, I will continue. Another aspect of what we do, ancestral burial, natural burial, green burial, that is distinctive from the mainstream funeral home industry is, we don't subject the deceased's body to foreign, alien, or disrespectful funeral, burial, or cultural practices that the deceased did not believe in or live according to. That's a drastic difference. The funeral home industry, you don't know who's in there. You don't know what they're doing. We've been in, we, the Ancestral Burial Society, our personnel, have been inside of um, funeral home preparation rooms. And some of the things we've seen with our own eyes, it will, it, will, it will give you nightmares if we tell you that right now. And so be it. I'm going to tell you that right now. We have been inside a funeral home preparation room where they had baby's body. Yes, a baby, an infant, a dead infant, just laying across just like it was trash, just like it was garbage. Inside the preparation room. You wouldn't know that because you're never allowed in there. And we're looking in the room like, what in the world these people are? We're talking about the funeral home. We're looking and saying these people are insane the way they have these bodies laid out. We've been in preparation room where they had bodies stacked up just like a warehouse. I'm talking about just all over the place. You, dear listener, or your family would know this because they don't allow you to go in the preparation room. But some of the things we've seen is so atrocious. Anybody that would allow their family member to be, of course, out of ignorance, to be handled by the funeral home industry, you have no idea what you're dealing with. You, you wouldn't have a clue. Now, to now quantify what the procedures we do to the body is, typically we would wash the body very gently with water, soapy water, and we do it just like you do with a newborn baby, very gently, very respectfully, and we cover the person's private parts up while we're doing all this so they wouldn't be exposed. So we, do, we have a certain very strict regimen that we follow that retains the body's dignity and the person's dignity. Typically, we invite family members to be in the room if they, if they wish to be in the room. In 99.9% .9 of cases, they, they come in. They're enthusiastic, want to you know, be able to get that last contact with uh, uh, taking care of their loved one. The funeral home industry doesn't do that. Let me be clear. They can't do that. The funeral home industry are prohibited from allowing family members to come in there while they're working on the bodies. It's against the law. So that's another distinction between what we do and what the funeral home industry does. Families can be in the room. They can be there. Actually, we'll walk them through the whole process of caring for their loved ones. So that, that's, it's, a, it's basically a night and day difference what I'm mentioning. Part of what we do also, I might mention, no unnatural ingredients, no unnatural fabrics, all natural fabrics. If there's anything being put on the loved one after they're washed and dried and their body is moisturized with natural oils, they're put in a shroud. And the shroud is natural materials. It's not artificial materials or some chemical lace materials. And of course, then they're put in a wooden, uh, if, the family, uh, if, if the family is bringing to the, their body to a cemetery that allows that sort of burial, then we can bury them straight in the shroud with no coffin. Now, if the family wants to put them in a coffin, what we always advise families to do is get a natural coffin, such as a 100% plain wooden casket. We advise families, do not get that $10,000 ridiculous millionaire casket with the spinning wheel models. That's insane. Full of toxic chemicals anyway, but the price of it alone is a crime in and of itself. So even with the casket, if there's a casket to be used, we, we only advise and promote natural materials. 
whether that's fabric materials or whether that's natural wood. So hopefully that answers the question about more distinctions about ancestral burial or natural burial, or green burial, and the mainstream funeral home process for burial. Now, it's something else I want to mention, if I might, Brother Sal. I would be remiss yeah, to not mention this. Or is yours, Dr. Director Z? The is yours, <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. We've already launched the truth exposure of the funeral home industry, but we are not done. We have to also launch the truth exposure of the cemetery industry. So let's back up. So now just imagine how ridiculous it is. Let's say your loved one. Your loved one was a healthy person. They exercised. They ate organic foods. They lived a healthy life. They believed in not dealing with non-toxic items. And the family are out of ignorance. And maybe they don't, are not connected to an organization that provides natural burial. Or none of their families could do it. The families out of ignorance turn over their bodies to the funeral home industry. They, that natural, organic, healthy person is now pumped full of cancer-causing agents. Chemical warfare, but it doesn't end there. Not only are they pumped full of formaldehyde and then their private regions or their body cavities stuffed with all sorts of foreign material, now they go to the cemetery. They're going to the cemetery in a casket made out of some material that more than likely has toxic paint, toxic glues in it. But now what happens when you go to the cemetery? They get put in the ground. Everybody would say, well, that's the same as if you're buried in a home burial. No, no, no. Number one, let's, let's just erase it all the way. An ancestral burial, it is a crime. It is a crime to bury your family member in anything except your family cemetery. Why? Because you retain possession. Your, your loved ones, they're your family's property, even after death. So you retain possession of their body by burying them in your family cemetery. That way you can make sure the cemetery is kept, everything is on the up and up. Some, somebody would say, you know what, that's not much different. The, the, the cemetery, the modern cemeteries, they take care of the lawn. No. In ancestral burial, it is illegal to bury your family member to, uh, next to anybody that is an extremely disreputable or disgusting person. Let me just make this plain so you can get where I'm going. How do you know your family member is not buried in a regular cemetery next to a child molester? How do you know they're not buried next to a rapist? I thought so. In traditional burial, if somebody was that low and disgusting and committing them type of crimes, they would not even be allowed to be buried in the family cemetery. They would be banished. Even their body would be banished. So that's part of the difference when we talk about green burial, natural burial, and of course, ancestral burial. Only certain types of honorable, reputable people could be buried in that family land or family cemetery. People that are all the way out of order, dis, dis, uh, disrespectful, disreputable criminals, rapists, child molesters. Your family member would never be buried next to them. In the normal, traditional cemetery, your family could be buried next to John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Dahmer, the neighborhood rapist, the neighborhood child molester. I'm showing, yet again, how ridiculous it is for people to avoid their responsibilities, not get their own family burial plots on burial family land, and outsource your family member. So your family member, and look, we're not going to say likely. We know it's the case. Because pretty much the way mainstream burial happens, nobody asks questions. Who, who are you burying my family member to? It is absolutely certain that all of us on this line have family members buried in cemeteries next to rapists, sex offenders, child molesters, serial killers, and whatever else. That is a legal act. That's a crime against nature, a crime against natural law, and a crime against ancestral burial. So those are part of the distinctions. Now I'm going to go further. Part of the distinctions between ancestral burial, number one, you would be the one caring for the grounds, the cemetery grounds. In the mainstream funeral industry, or cemetery, let me be clear, do you know how many tons, tons, millions of tons of pesticide, herbicide, 
insecticide, and all type of unnatural chemicals, they spray on those lawns to keep them so-called perfectly manicured. So not only did your family member get shot full of formaldehyde and all type of toxic chemicals, not only what, did you encase them inside, inside of a coffin that's full of all sorts of toxic materials, but you went and you did even the unforgivable. You buried them in a cemetery where they're getting sprayed. The lawn is getting sprayed with all type of for, uh, herbicide, pesticide, whatever, insecticide. So it's an ecological disaster. Basically, the whole cemetery industry, like the funeral industry, is nothing but a crime against nature because it's poisoning the earth. That's the only reason those cemetery lawns look like that. They're spraying all sorts of toxic poisons on those cemetery lawns, just like they do everywhere else, golf courses, college campuses, and the like. So I want to emphasize that people need to understand participating in the modern funeral industry, you are destroying nature. You commit crimes against nature. If you participate in burial in the modern cemetery industry, you're committing crimes against nature. You actually are complicit in destroying the environment. And your family member is not resting in peace. We need to evacuate that whole ridiculous concept. Rest in peace. How are they going to rest in peace with formaldehyde pumped inside of them? How are they going to rest in peace next to a child molester? That's not resting in peace. You ask me, that's resting in hell. Hopefully that answers your question. Oh, man. Director Z is letting you know, guys know what's going on. Right here on the Bay Talk, you ready? The number is 319-527-6239. And uh, Sister Maya has some technical difficulties, but she's back. I see she's back. Uh, anything, anything that you want to put out there uh, since you were gone? You want to, you know, you heard a lot of stuff going down, a lot of information. Anything you want to put out there, Sister Maya? Go ahead. Just, just for sure. Oh, no, I was just saying, I just hope Israel definitely appreciating, you know, this um, organization that the Father have called forth. I really appreciate it. But you see that he's very passionate um about it and i was just wanting to put out that i wasn't sure in the meanwhile the little gap i was gone that um if brother zayab did you get a chance to discuss that people that do have um life insurance policy in place could you explain to the family how does that work if we want to utilize our life insurance and to work with your um burial society could you explain that to the family if you have not already if i missed it i apologize but um that was near and dear to me i yield indeed I did. I did mention uh, slightly some other uh, the, uh, gentleman earlier had sp- asked about it. Um, you're asking about it. I mentioned just a slight part of it because what we're advising people, because it's such a complex issue, uh, to reach out to us, email, Facebook, or, uh, you know, click in the links that we provided. But nonetheless, if somebody has life insurance, you can use that life insurance to actually pay for any natural burial services. Basically, you have to just designate in your life insurance whatever you want allocated or done or paid and designated to whom and for what services. So, but with that said, it's even more complex for that. So in the interest of time, what we would suggest for people that have those questions, and pretty, which pretty much require a very uh, in-depth answer, reach out to us, please, at the links we provided through clicking on the link that's on the podcast, reaching us at Facebook, Ancestral Burial on Facebook, and also GreenBurialSociety.com. Excuse me. Excuse me. I apologize. GreenBurialSociety at gmail.com. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I definitely thank you for um, answering that. That was near and dear to my heart. But, I, yeah, I'm just taking in more information again. I, I really appreciate your organization being called for, especially for such a time as this and the climate that we're living in, you know? Sure. Thank you. Most definitely. Now, if um, I may, if I may good. go, uh, uh, something I need to mention, if that's fine with you, Brother Sal. Go ahead, brother. You got it. Go ahead. Sure. Let me highlight something. Is there anyone on the phone that would accept physical abuse against a living family member? How about domestic abuse? Is there anyone on the phone, any of the listeners that would accept that? How about abandonment of your family member? Anybody? Is there anybody would accept uh, making your family members homeless? You know, just tell them, go, you know. Of course, we're not talking about people that, you know, deserve it, quote, unquote. But under normal circumstances, you wouldn't accept this 
for your family members. Now, why am I saying this? Going back to the cemetery industry and shooting another piercing arrow of truth, what people are actually doing that they're unaware of, you are abusing, you are, you are abusing the corpse, the body of your loved one by turning them over to the funeral home because that's abuse, injecting them with poison. That's domestic abuse, corpse abuse. That would be considered in traditional cultures ancestral abandonment. You're giving over your loved one's body to be perpetually cared for, quote, unquote, abused by some foreign entity. That's also homelessness. you subjecting your loved one's body to homelessness. In traditional culture, your land that you live in is for to have a house, is to grow crops. It's many uses for land. Get water, have animals. It's also to have a grave site. So people, due to ignorance, you're actually subjecting your loved ones. When you put them in a foreign cemetery that's not owned by you, you're making them homeless. And you're paying for it. It's no different than putting one of your loved ones in a homeless shelter, a group home, a foster care. You wouldn't allow that. Putting your loved one's body because of indoctrination and brainwashing, we understand that, but it's ridiculous. You're giving your loved one's body away to people that are whatever they are. You don't know these people. So that, that I'm just highlighting these things to be aware. That's a form of slavery on top of it to make it worse. And I know that's a strong word, but so be it. You're paying these people to incarcerate your loved ones in these chemical lace cemeteries. Chemical lace! There was an article. Please, dear listener, check this to make sure what I'm saying is not incorrect. There was a, do- a documentary called Ground War. It came out. It was a video documentary called Ground War. Look it up. And what the documentary is about is a man, his father used to play golf on golf courses. His father got diagnosed with cancer. They couldn't understand it because the father lived a healthy life. So after the father died, the son did some investigation, and I guess they probably got information from the autopsy and other things, testing the golf course grass. They found out that it was massive amounts of pesticides, chemicals, lawn care chemicals, and all that that normally they spray on the golf courses that his father was exposed to. And that contributed, he's alleging that that contributed to his father's death because his father was a healthy person. Why am I mentioning this? Be aware, dear listener, that that pesticide, insecticide, whatever, is constantly being sprayed on top of your loved one, the lawns of these cemeteries. So how in the world could somebody say, rest in peace? Rest in peace? Is, are you being facetious? Are you being sarcastic? Who in the world could rest in peace with chemicals being sprayed on top of them that, that's insane. As I mentioned, I don't need to mention it, but so be it. Let's throw one in for the road. Who in the world will rest in peace if they may be buried next to a child molester, a serial killer, or a rapist? Uh, I mean, are we, are we for real here? Are we kidding here? So no. Uh, look up the documentary, Ground War. It's about, it's showing how many pesticides, and they use those type of pesticides for um, uh, cemeteries, golf courses, etc. Millions, millions of pounds are sprayed all over the United States. And of course, we know people spray them on their residential lawns, of course, but we're talking about cemeteries right now. That's what you're subjecting your loved one to. You would never see that in a real, uh, in a, 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 a natural setting where a family has this burial plot and they, they care for the grounds of the cemetery that their loved ones are married, are, are, are buried in. So be aware, it's night and day. It's not the same thing. All right, someone is asking on social media, on Facebook, someone is asking on Facebook, um, how long has the Ancestral Burial Society been in effect? They want to know. Over 14 years. All right. Over 14 up. years. We've been, yes, we've been in existence over 14 years. And, uh, you know, it's been a wonderful uh, experience, and we continue on. By the way, I might mention, we provide and assist families and guide families and individuals and organizations and communities, et cetera. We, we deal with all people. So we're not limited to one demographic. So we help anyone that wants to either learn or be taught 
or practice or institute natural ancestral green burial for their family, their organization, their community, their culture, whatever. So we work with people across the board. We're not limited to one demographic. So I need to be emphasize that. But nonetheless, we deal with, we uh, assist families with from A to Z. Everything from burial plans to if they want somebody trained in their family to do this, if they have an organization, they want to create a burial society in their organization or their fam or their community or culture. From A to Z, we deal with uh, you know just a range of all of those things. And also, if if a family or community or culture or whatever, if people own land and they want to turn it into a fam a, a, a cemetery. We also provide those services where we can help them design that as a cemetery and basically put it in effect. We've done that. All right, family, the number is 319-527-6239. I'm on the website, and when you click on the link, you can check it out. It says, uh, you know, the Ancestral Burial Society provides a lot, provides a lot of services. Uh, natural burials, uh, burial planning, estate planning, and they even, uh, you know, train you in different areas, uh, green burial education and training. Um, but I, I believe what makes um, folk behind the scenes, Director Z, and what makes um, the Ancestral Burial Society to me unique is that um, also if you're having financial issues, there's ways that you guys can assist in that area as well. Uh, let the family know when it comes to that. Uh, go ahead. Yes. Uh, thank you. That's a great point. Um, well, as you know, cash is king at the funeral home. Uh, people that have had the experience, look, don't go up to the funeral home telling them you don't have any money because you already know. They're going to tell you, well, uh, no cash, no service, point blank. Also, if you happen not to pay the funeral home, this look, you can type this up and into the Internet and do searches on this. Funeral homes have been known to hold people's family members' bodies hostage because they couldn't pay. Now, I'm not answering yay or nay, because obviously we know people have to pay their bills. If you ask an organization to do something for you, obviously you can't just run out the tab. But nonetheless, I'm making a point that people need to realize the funeral home industry, it is a business first. First. So they're there to make money. Our purpose is not money. Our purpose is natural burial to protect the environment and bring dignity to the deceased and to keep the cost of burial um, affordable and also to make families autonomous where you don't need to be begging somebody else outside of your family, culture, community, organization to bury you. So that's, those are our purposes first. Now, with that said, to the point, if families have monetary issues, we will work with families. We've done it numerous times before. We've held fundraisers to help get money up, to help uh, uh, defray the cost of burial for families and various other measures. So we will work with families if they are experiencing financial difficulties. And we have a variety of processes to do that, including fundraising, burial fund, et cetera, et cetera. However, I must mention this. We highly advise families what you need to do if you're serious, is reach out to us and we'll show you how you can put things in place where you won't never have any financial difficulties with burial because you'll already have a burial fund in place. Or you can join a pre-existing burial fund and, and get the benefits from that. So we do... Don't wait until something happens and then, you know, now you, you're operating from behind if you find out there's organization and people such as us doing what we do, reach out, find out the areas that you're weak in in terms of mon money, and then put those areas in place. Now, to that, if I might brother, say, Brother Sal, I need to mention this. There is this thing, as you mentioned earlier, that oftentimes people will say, I don't have the money. Well, look, where are you getting the money from for that liquor you're drinking? Where are you getting the money from from the cigarettes you're smoking? Where you get the money from for, you know what I'm saying. Where you get the money from for those $200 shoes you win? So priority is important. Prioritize what money you do have and have it being saved to make sure you take care of that cost. Just like you know you have to eat. You know, you, you know people are going to die. You allocate money for food. You allocate money for basic items, utilities. So 
allocate money for a burial. Now, I'm going to mention this. Burial is an economy. People don't realize. If you have 100 family members, and you don't have any type of self-sufficient burial system within your family, your culture, your community, your organization, add up over time 100 family members what the cost of that is. I already did it for you. I saved your time. I knew we were going to have the workshop, so I already did it. I gave earlier a in the country from 5,000 to 10,000. If you have 100 family members, let's say we already know everybody's going to be deceased, but if you have 100 family members, you know what 100 times 5,000 is? We're going on the low end. 100 times 5, uh, uh, 100 family members deceased over time times 5,000 is $500,000. Do you see how much money went out of your family? Now, just imagine if you had some internal burial process. A huge percentage of that money would stay in your family. Now, I'm just mentioning that because I want to emphasize so people are aware that do not think it's just a matter of you don't have money. If you don't have your own internal burial system, that's part of the reason why you don't have money. Because every time you're spending money to bury one of your family members, it's going outside the family instead of inside the family. So learning how to bury your own family members, you are gaining control of the family burial economy. That's the point I'm making. That alone, that alone will limit or eliminate the possibility of you not having money to bury your family members. All right, family, once again, we appreciate you guys kind of winding down the last minutes of the show. And again, I have all the links in the description box. I have the Facebook page. The email is greenburialsociety at gmail.com. If you don't remember anything else, greenburialsociety at gmail.com. And I have all the links in the description box for those who want to reach out to Director Z and the Ancestral Burial Society. We appreciate everybody that's been listening. Um, is there any last words? Any last words? Sister Maya, I see you still on the phone lines. Anything else you want to provide? We're winding down. Anything else we want to put out there? Go ahead. Uh, I was just hoping that the family would appreciate, like I said, this beautiful organization that's been called forth and get in contact with this brother and do what's needed to, you know, take care of their families and also spread and share um, the word around Israel because so many people do not know about it. I didn't know about it, and I was really flabbergasted and appalled when he told me how many years because I was thinking maybe two to three, but 14 years, that, that blew me away. So I just asked the family to take time to investigate it. Um, to share it with other family members and to reach out to this brother um, and support this um, beautiful society that the father have Love called you. forth in these um, end times. Um, I appreciate you, brothers, brothers I have, and everything that you all are doing over there. I, I'm I'm behind you guys 100%. You know that. And thank you, um, Sal, for, you know, allowing him to share this platform to get the word out. I, I, I had always told him so, you know, raved about, you know, debate talk with you. You got to get on there. And I'm so thankful that the Father made it happen. So we thank you um, for making time, you know, for him to come and share this. And I yield. All right. Well, thank I appreciate you, you well. Appreciate you. Go ahead, Director Z. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you, Brother Sal. Thank you, sister. We appreciate your support. And thank you. And also, Brother Sal, a few things I might mention in wrapping up the show, um, again, emphasizing to everyone that's listening, the Ancestral Burial Society provides a wide range of uh, services and resources to families and those that would like to get their family or organization or cultural community into doing natural burial. Um, those things run all the way from, for example, in the, as far as proactiveness, wills, burial power of attorneys, uh, burial funds. Uh, uh, family or community members who are trained in natural burial uh, will assist uh, and guide people of how to, you know, structure their life insurance uh, based especially on the size of your family. Uh, if people desire or wish to uh, get or create a family or community burial fund, we'll help with that. If people are designed to create a cemetery 
on your family-owned land or for your community, we'll help on that. Also, I might mention, um, we have a range of educational um, uh, workshops that we give normally to educate the public as we're doing now, but these are professional ones, intensive, that are actually training workshops. We'll actually have people that are, you know, enrolled in those workshops going through the whole motions of preparing bodies on mannequins. So we do that. And those workshops are on everything from natural burial preparation to if you want to learn how to uh, hold a funeral, a funeral inside your family home. If you want to do a burial on your family land, if you want to create a, a family cemetery or aftercare, look, we have workshops for all that. And also, of course, we have the Green Burial Education Program. That is the flagship program that we use to train people from top to bottom. And then if people want to become apprentices in the Green Burial, in the Ancestral Burial Society, they can do so. That opportunity is there. Also, we have opportunities for volunteers, those that want to volunteer um, working with the Ancestral Burial Society, it may not be that somebody's comfortable with working with bodies. That's not an issue. We have a whole host of opportunities and a wide range of areas for people that want to, you know, assist by volunteering. That, that, that runs all the way from natural burial preparation, funeral management, grave burial, widow and orphan assistance, grief counseling, applying for survivor benefits. I mean, the list is on emailing, networking, marketing, fundraising, graphic design, content creation, whatever. So we have a whole lit, uh, a, a range of things that people can do and, and, and um, come in as volunteers. So reach out to us on that. If people would like to donate, uh, click the link on the podcast or reach out to us uh, on Facebook. But we have an actual page, donation page for that. So if people want to support that way or in any other and also, we have a membership process that people would like to become their families, individuals, their families, their communities, or even if a whole entire organization wants to become members of the Ancestral Burial Society, hey, we have that available, different levels and tiers of membership for those that are interested to be able to avail and uh, access those services. So that, 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 those things I just wanted to emphasize, it's a range of things, and we're we are more than happy. Matter of fact, it's our duty and obligation to make these things available to the public so that any families that are uh, experiencing death, um, they will be able to do what they need to do in as autonomous a fashion as possible. Help keep the show on the air. If you want to help, you can send your donation through PayPal. The email is debatingtalkforyou at gmail.com or through cash app, dollar sign, Sal Showtime. Thanks for your support. Planets of the Beats, the Beat Talk Free Radio.